laterally here. Um, he is currently, the, as I indicated, he's a park ranger with the uh, Frederick Douglass National Storage Site. And um, he has also served at Fort Sumter National Monument, the National Mall, and um, he holds a bachelor's degree in history and in Spanish from the University of Wisconsin. So that makes him a, a I guess, a, a, a Yankee Badger. I, <laughs> so I say that because he received his master's in public history from the University of South Carolina. So I'm sure he got jokes about being a Yankee down south. Um, his work has focused mainly on uh, historical interpretation and cultural resources for a diverse audience. One thing I'd like to say that um, some of you who have not gone to the current uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, it opens, as you know, this uh, Friday, no, Saturday, the 24th. And I was telling Nate that there are a number of quotes relating to Frederick Douglass there at the National, um, at, the, at that National Museum. So it's, uh, it's very good that he's able to be here to discuss uh, the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. Just one other acknowledgement, I'd like to also acknowledge the contributions of the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture from the perspectives that they actually underwrote this, um, our public discussion, and um, I'd like to thank them for that. And I also would like to acknowledge for those who have not, have not uh, visited our exhibit, which is basically honoring the centennial of the National Historic uh, National Park Service, trailblazing um, 100 years of the National Parks. Please do so. Um, the, this particular event, this lecture is in collaboration with the centennial, as I indicated, as well as with the opening of the, of the African American Museum. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Nate Johnson. And uh, we'll have a mic for the next uh, hour. All right, well, thank you, Kelvin. Thank you to the National Post Museum and the National Museum of African American History and Culture for making this talk possible. Thank you to all you who are here and to everyone who's watching on Facebook. So I'll be giving a program here. I have to cover the three main things that I want to tell you who Frederick Douglass is, um, how his last house came to be a historic site, and why the National Park Service cares for that site today. Um, and I'll get through it in about half an hour or so, now about 15 minutes for questions. And now I'll put that back. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'll lean over like this. There we go. That sounds pretty good. All right, so to take it back around, the National Park Service cares for this site today because Frederick Douglass is a nationally significant figure. And he's somebody who you have to understand if you want to understand U.S. history. You have to know Frederick Douglass' story. Um, I firmly believe that. Our staff at the site believes that. The National Park Service believes that's um, one of uh, 412 units in the National Park System. Um, so who was Frederick Douglass? How can you learn about it when you come to the site? Tell you a little bit about the site. We care for his last house. It's Cedar Hill. It's in the southeast part of DC in the Anacostia neighborhood. Uh, the National Park Service cares for eight acres of Frederick Douglass's original estate, uh, his original home, and then a vast collection of about 27,000 objects, most of which belong to Frederick Douglass. Uh, so it is a unique site. Um, and it's a place where we're able to explore Frederick Douglass's complex story and just talk about who he was as a person. One of the things about history as you study it, we study these giant figures and it's hard to humanize people like Frederick Douglass, um, especially if you're reading a book, uh, watching a biography, something like that. But when you're in Frederick Douglass's house, uh, his place Cedar Hill, it, you feel Frederick Douglass's presence. It's not hard to humanize Frederick Douglass when you're in his house. 
Uh, and a lot of visitors start to ask questions more about his personality. Who was he as a person? Um, they know a lot about his past, having been born into slavery, being an abolitionist, and so forth. Uh, but people want to know questions like, what was his sense of humor like? That comes up every once in a while. And I don't know that too many historians have to answer the question, what was Frederick Douglass's sense of humor? Uh, but that's one question that at least I get on my tours at, at his house. Uh, and this is a quote that I often use to talk about Frederick Douglass's sense of humor. And it deals actually with who he was as a person. He often spoke in front of large crowds. Uh, his reputation preceded him. People knew who he was. Uh, and even 30 years after he escaped from slavery, he would still be announced, uh, introduced as the fugitive slave. Uh, and so Frederick Douglass would start his speeches by acknowledging that. And this is the quote I'm going to read you. This is a speech he gave, it's right around the time after the Civil War ended, right in the early years of Reconstruction. And he plays off that concept uh, of being a fugitive. So the quote starts, I have been called a thief. While I confess that I did something that bore that construction years ago, for in fact I stole myself. And at that the crowd laughed and applauded. So whoever was reporting for the speech captured the audience's responses. Frederick Douglass continued, I was a piece of property. I was owned. I was what they call a chattel to all intents and purposes by a fair construction of the law. And yet in the face of that fact, I took possession of myself. I put a bundle on my shoulder and left. And I made my way north. God in his wisdom when he sent man into the world fitted him out with two arms, two hands, and two legs. Philosophy teaches that one man's liberty begins where another's ends. So I ran away, it is true, but I ran away on my own legs. And at that the crowd laughed and applauded again. He says, and I left everybody else in possession of their legs. And at that the crowd erupted into laughter again. So I think today that kind of strikes us as odd that Barry Douglas makes light of this, his own tragic story, having been born into slavery. Uh, but what he's doing with that is he's setting his audience at ease. They already know these things about him. Uh, and he's covering pretty common ground. And he's also revealing uh, the strongest anti-slavery arguments that there were right, about human rights, that we belong to ourselves, we can't belong to another person. And he's critiquing what slavery, anti-slavery defenses were, pro-slavery defenses, where many said, well, it's God's will, it's providence. Frederick Douglass says, well, then God gave me two arms, two legs, and a heart and a brain, I can run away just like anybody else. So Frederick Douglass, um, is revealing a lot about where he stands on slavery and his own story at the same time, that he's kind of making light of it. Now, Frederick Douglass, of course, grew up in slavery. He experienced slavery. He's also a keen observer of slavery. He saw how it worked as a system. And that's what I'm going to cover here, just in talking about who Frederick Douglass was as a person, is how he experienced and observed slavery at the same time. So he was born into slavery in 1818 in rural Maryland on the eastern shore, Talbot County. He described it as being a very destitute area. He had a very difficult family life. He did not know who his father was. He barely knew his mother. She lived on another plantation about 12 miles away and only got to see him occasionally if she made the walk at night and then made the walk back in the morning uh, before she had to be back on the plantation that she belonged to. So he had a very difficult family life. He is largely raised by his grandmother, and he is raised by his aunts. Um, at age six, he was ordered to go to this house, the Y House, um, which was owned by one of his slave owners, and that's where he first met his siblings. He also grew up distant from his siblings and half-siblings. He said when he met them at six years old, and they were virtually strangers. Even that connection was starting to be lost there. Now, at eight years old, he was separated from all of his family. At that point, his slave owner sent him to Baltimore. And again, this is a very difficult part of his life, but I also think it's surprising to find that he um, also regarded it as a complex situation in his life. He um, obviously saw being moved around, being forced to move around. It's difficult, but he did say too, quote, I found no severe trial in my departure. Here's the reason why he said, quote, my home was charmless, it was not home to me. So a lot of what we think about being home, Frederick Douglass didn't experience as a child. And instead what he says is that being sent to Baltimore, quote, laid the foundation and opened the gateway to all my son. The time that Frederick Douglass showed up, 
but there are about 17,000 free black people living there. So that free black population really outnumbered the enslaved population, and Frederick Douglass, as a young boy and as a teenager, can take advantage of that, and he can start to make ties with the free black community. Well, that's exactly what Frederick Douglass does. He starts to teach himself to read and write. He can get away with that in the streets of Baltimore. His job in Baltimore is to be a body servant to the family he was hired out to, to accompany the young boy and that family around the school, to walk with them through the streets. Frederick Douglass started to pick up discarded literature in the streets, newspapers, things like that, and started to teach himself to read and write. Um, and actually, importantly, before that, the slave owner's wife had started to teach Frederick Douglass how to read and write. He'd approached her, and he'd asked her, he said, hey, I want to read the Bible. Uh, can you teach me how to read the Bible? And she said, yes, I can, I can teach you that. Um, what Frederick Douglass explained is that she had not grown up as a slave owner. Uh, her husband was a slave owner, but she was not. And so she looked at him as she would look at any other boy who asked to be able to learn to read. And she started to teach him. Frederick Douglass said those were great lessons. But he said the biggest lesson came when her husband found them doing that and stopped her and said, you cannot teach young Frederick to be, or to read that will unfit him to be a slave. And so Frederick Douglass heard that at about eight years old, and he made this connection between literacy and freedom, and that only intensified his need, his desire, his want to read. So he started to pick up books in the street, started to pick up newspapers in the street. He found sympathetic young white boys who also would teach him to read and write. Uh, and he started to pick up his lessons that way. He had no formal education. He educated himself. Uh, he found sympathetic people who would teach him his lessons. It's extraordinary to think how much Frederick Douglass has shaped our thought through his words, that he's entirely self-taught. So that connection between literacy and freedom is very important. Frederick Douglass eventually wasn't uh, pleased just picking up books. Uh, the story of picking up discarded literature in the streets of Baltimore. He actually went out and bought his own book at 12 years old. He saved up coins by polishing men's boots in the streets of Baltimore. And he went out and bought a copy of the Columbian Order, which you see to the right of the screen. Columbian Order was a famous uh, lesson book back then. It's something that young school children use to uh, learn how to speak in public. And it was full of revolutionary era speeches and writings on natural rights. Think about that book. Frederick Douglass learned a lot of lessons from that book. And those early arguments that he makes about owning his own body, his own legs, that even comes from this book. Frederick Douglass says this is a very formative book in Frederick Douglass's education, self-education. So he resisted slavery in a number of ways. Um, first of all, he's going to learn how reading and writing can uh, help him to resist slavery. He's eventually sent back um, to the eastern shore of Maryland. And he's self-educated. He says he's going to educate other people on the plantation that he's hired out to. So he starts to teach other enslaved people to read and write. Um, he starts to, uh, he actually once physically fought back against a slaveholder uh, when he's in the Eastern Shore. And he ultimately started to plan his escapes. Um, he planned his first escape with some other uh, young men. And they were caught in that attempt. They are thrown in jail. Uh, so Frederick Douglass' first attempt at escaping was unsuccessful. It happens when he's like 18 years old. And with that, his slave owner kind of like threw up his hands, didn't know what to do, and said, well, I'll send you back to Baltimore. And that's where Frederick Douglass will succeed in escaping. So these ties with the free black community start to become a lot stronger as he's a teenager, a young man. Um, he meets a lot of people because he's down in the um, shipyards of Baltimore and he'd hired himself out to work as a ship hawker there. There were a lot of free black sailors in Baltimore. Uh, and Frederick Douglass met some free black sailors, uh, one who agreed to lend him papers that certified his freedom. Frederick Douglass said he posed as that man when he escaped. I needed money because he wanted to be able to pay for train and ferry tickets to get from Baltimore up north. He didn't have money, but he met a young woman named Anna. And she was born free, so she did have her own possessions. She sold a feather bed of hers, gave that money to Frederick Douglass. He used it to buy a train ticket in Baltimore, got on board a train, he had to jump over to a ferry, jump over a train, jump over to a ferry. He's making his way up to New York City. And one day he got from Baltimore to New York City. Uh, one day, very quick. He said there are actually instances where he ran into people that he knew that he thought would turn him in for one reason or another. They didn't recognize him or they just decided to look the other way. 
Larry Douglas is very fortunate to have escaped. They also had a really good plan set up, good support system. Uh, and if it were not for Anna, we might never know who Frederick Douglass was. She made that escape um, very possible. Uh, once he escaped out of New York, he wrote to Anna. She didn't travel with him. That wouldn't have been safe. Uh, so he wrote to her. She made her way to New York City. About a week and a half later, she arrived there. And they got married immediately in the home of a black abolitionist. Uh, and they're married by another black abolitionist. So they start to make these ties with the abolitionist community very early on. I uh, decide New York City is not going to be a good place to be for Frederick Douglass. He's a fugitive. He can be captured, re-enslaved. Uh, they make their way up to Massachusetts. They figure that is one of the safer places to be without going to Canada, uh, going farther up in the Northeast, where it was uh, possible to remain free for probably, hopefully longer. Uh, so they made their way to New Bedford. They arrived in this house here, which is the Holly and Nathan Johnson house, which is my own name, by the way, Nathan Johnson. No relation. I wish there were, but uh, Nathan Johnson was another free black abolitionist who was working and living uh, up in New Bedford. And the Johnsons took the, uh, actually, they didn't have a last name, but they took the Baileys, and Frederick Douglass's last name was actually Bailey. So they took Frederick Bailey and Anna in, uh, and that's where they settled on the name Douglass because Johnson was reading a book uh, by Sir Walter Scott, or a poem by Sir Walter Scott, he suggested a character's name, a um, character named Douglas for uh, their last name. So the, they became the Douglases, just like that. That's Frederick Douglass's own name. So that stuck. Frederick Douglass started then to work as an abolitionist in Massachusetts. And his work as an abolitionist kind of uh, coincides with him and Anna beginning their family. They had um, ultimately five children together. These are their four children who lived in adulthood. There was no known photo of their fifth child, Annie, until recently a historian discovered, uh, possibly this year, uh, a photo of, Anna, of their youngest daughter, Annie. Um, and so that has not been published anywhere yet, but hopefully that picture will be out soon. These are their four children who survived to adulthood, Rosetta, Lewis, Frederick Jr., and Charles. They're all born in Massachusetts, and we'll talk more about them later because their story is also very important. And as he and Anna start their family, that's when Frederick Douglass starts to become an abolitionist. So he first started working as a laborer up in Massachusetts, kind of picked up work wherever he could. He started to attend the abolitionist meetings at the same time, and uh, people started to ask him his story. He started to tell it. Started to speak in front of audiences, and eventually he caught the attention of some very prominent abolitionists, including William Lloyd Garrison. And he was asked to become an agent for the Massachusetts Anti Slavery Society, which is one of the biggest abolitionist societies. And so Frederick Douglass's fame uh, just increased greatly from that point on. Frederick Douglass said he was scared to start giving speeches. He said he stand up in front of crowds and tremble like a leaf, but his story captivated his audience, and he had to have had a lot of skill, otherwise he wouldn't have been, um, wouldn't have been hired in the first place, so he might have uh, mentally been trembling up there. But his audience was captivated since the start. Um, Frederick Douglass was able to give a lot of perspective to the abolitionist movement. Um, William Lloyd Garrison, for example, was, was a white abolitionist. Many of the abolitionists with whom he worked were white, he worked with black abolitionists too, but for sure white abolitionists could not bring the same perspective to the movement that Frederick Douglass and other black abolitionists who lived through slavery could. Frederick Douglass could say, I know about slavery because I experienced it for 20 years of my life and I can tell you all about it. So Frederick Douglass brought that perspective to the abolitionist movement and he is very skillful in telling it. A lot of people heard how good he was as a public speaker. Uh, the words that he used uh, and the power with he spoke, and they'd say, well, how, how could you have been enslaved? You speak way too well to have been a slave. And at the first point, that's a stereotype in the first place. Um, but Frederick Douglass uh, tries to say, no, no, I educated myself. Um, that's why I'm just I'm presenting what I know, and I'm presenting, really, I'm the product of my own determination. Um, but still people don't believe him, so he decides that he's going to publish his first autobiography, and that's going to put names and places on paper. He's been telling his story the whole time, but the narrative puts all his slave owner's name on paper. Uh, it puts all the places he grew up on paper, and that book sells very well, very, very well. It's really what makes Frederick Douglass become an international figure. 
Um, it's translated into a few different languages. Frederick Douglass actually makes copies of the book and he goes overseas to Great Britain and he sells even more copies of it there. Now, one of the reasons Frederick Douglass decided to go to Great Britain in the first place though is because as he puts down all these names and places on paper, it's becoming dangerous for him to be uh, out there telling his story. If any of his slave owners, anybody who's hired out to wants to take revenge, try to stop him from getting the story out, they might try to re-enslave him. So he headed over to Great Britain to avoid that. And it's in Great Britain that abolitionists there offer to purchase Frederick Douglass's freedom. Frederick Douglass accepts that offer. And after about two years in Great Britain, he returned home to his family with his freedom purchased um, from his slave owner at that point. He is now legally free. So Frederick Douglass, while he's working as an abolitionist, it's important to recognize he's a fugitive that is very dangerous work to be a fugitive and an abolitionist who is so public at the same time. Frederick Douglass worked with a number of other abolitionists. I'm not going to be able to go through um, all of the people with whom he worked. It's just important to recognize abolitionists had one, uh, well, a few big goals in mind. Of course, they wanted slavery to end. They wanted it to end immediately. They didn't want slaveholders to be compensated for their human property. And they did not want anybody who was freed from slavery to go overseas to start any sort of colony. There was this colonization idea that people who are freed from slavery should maybe go to Central America or to Africa like Liberia. Um, and abolitionists, most almost all of them said no, 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 no colonization. Um, anybody who's born in this country is an American and should have the rights and privileges, privileges of an American. Now, among them, they all disagree on the means on which that is going to happen. Can the Constitution be used as an anti-slavery instrument? Can violence be used in ending slavery? And these abolitionists uh, all differ in their opinions on how slavery will be ended. Eventually, a nation erupts into civil war over the question of slavery. Frederick Douglass sees this as an opportunity to end slavery itself. He wants emancipation to be one of the outcomes of the war, and he really works strongly towards those ends. One of the things that he does, too, is that he helps to recruit men into the 54th Massachusetts, which is one of the first all-black units to fight during the Civil War. And one of the things that's important about that is as the Civil War starts, is just white men who are allowed to fight in the army. Frederick Douglass is famous for telling Lincoln and other politicians, that's like fighting this war with one hand behind your back. Why would you not want black men to fight in the army? Um, and eventually, the U.S. Army does allow black units. They are segregated units, they are entirely black units, but they do allow black units to fight in the Army. 54th Massachusetts is one of the first out there. Frederick Douglass's two sons, uh, Lewis on the left and Charles on the right, enlist in that unit. They're living in the state of New York at the time, but they're allowed to enlist in the 54th Massachusetts. Black troops did not receive equal pay, often did not receive equal treatment. Frederick Douglass is uh, one of some of the work that he does is also to go and talk to Lincoln and other officials and, and advocate on their behalf and say we need equal treatment, we need equal pay. Um, and so Frederick Douglass starts to come down to Washington, D.C. a lot. Uh, beforehand, he'd been concentrated up in the Northeast, Midwest. Uh, now he starts to come to D.C. And that's important too because I think he has to come through Maryland, which is still a slaveholding state during the Civil War. He avoids Maryland, he never goes back to Maryland. Uh, until after the Civil War, actually until Maryland abolishes slavery. So during the Civil War, Frederick Douglass's uh, fame just increases even more as he starts to do this sort of work. Of course, with the end of the Civil War comes the end of slavery. Frederick Douglass does not just put down his pen. He doesn't just step away from the podium and say, all right, my work is done. He recognizes that his fight for the end of slavery is part of this larger fight for racial equality. And he's also been fighting for women's rights the whole time, which I haven't had a chance to really expand on, but he's fighting for women's rights, really the equality of all people. He's fighting for justice and equality for all. So Frederick Douglass continues his public career, and he starts to do more work in Washington, D.C. So he's pursuing those um, same ideas of equality and justice. He's also um, doing a lot more political work. That political work, of course, began with his uh, relationship with Lincoln. Frederick Douglass started to work with a lot of presidents. He was often asked to be an advisor, especially on race relations. Uh, and Frederick Douglass was, of course, still highly regarded as a great public speaker, so a lot of candidates, presidential candidates, asked him to be a stump speaker. He'd go out and speak for them. He'd help to raise votes. 
as a result of that, Frederick Douglass started to get appointments. And he got some early appointments soon after moving to D.C. When he moves to D.C., he first lived in this house, which is right behind the Supreme Court. It still stands today. It's on the 300 block of A Street Northeast. For a while, the Smithsonian operated the African Art Museum out of this building. Um, and today it's operated as part of the Caring Institute, which is a non-profit. Um, Frederick Douglass is actually visible in the picture. He's down um, to the right of the building, standing with his top hat on. And if you go to the site today, the one that I work at, which is of course a different house, you can see one of Frederick Douglass's top hats there. It's kind of a cool tie. Now, Frederick Douglass decided to leave downtown DC. He was there for about five years, uh, and then he decided to move out to Cedar Hill, which again is where I work. So he moved out to the suburbs. This house is out in Anacostia. Um, at that time, the section of Anacostia he lived in was called Union Town. It was a small little town that started in the 1850s. It was its own entity. It was Union Town, D.C. Uh, and Frederick Douglass had the biggest, uh, nicest piece of property in Union Town. Everybody else lived in a fraction of an acre lot. Frederick Douglass owned about at the most 15 acres of land. He had this nice big house. It's hard to tell from this picture, but it sat, still sits up on top of a hill that gives it a view of everything all around. There's nothing, it's unobstructed view. There's nothing in front of his house, except for some trees like you see there. Uh, and so if you step past those trees, you get to see the Capitol. You get to see the Washington Monument, all of downtown Washington. You can see in the Maryland, you can see in the Virginia. Um, it is an awesome, awesome view. Uh, and so it shows Frederick Douglass's status uh, at that point in his life. He was 59 years old when he bought this house. He's internationally recognized, uh, and he's still very active in his public, his political life. Now, when he moved into this house, he'd just been appointed U.S. Marshal of D.C., and that was a very high honor. It was a presidential appointment. He was appointed by President Rutherford B. Hayes. It's pictured here. And he worked in the district judicial system right here in D.C. He actually worked over at what's now uh, well, it's Old City Hall. It's like City Hall. He worked out of that office. Um, he was a reporter of Derry. He was a U.S. Marshal there for four years, one of the high honors. It's pictured on the left. That drawing shows Frederick Douglass as U.S. Marshal, um, leading President Hayes and the incumbent James Garfield through the halls of the Capitol. They later pop out the door on the east side of the Capitol, walk down the stairs as thousands of people watched because James Garfield was about to um, take his inaugural oath and give his speech. So Frederick Douglass accompanied both of them at that moment, and he sat back later and wrote about it. He said, just think about me, this man who was formerly enslaved, now walking in front of the eyes of millions, really, as the whole nation watched this huge moment in history. And Frederick Douglass is right there in the middle of it. So very high honors with these appointments. Frederick Douglass went on to serve as recorder of deeds under three appointments, and uh, three presidents, James Garfield, who he'd walked down to the podium, Chester Arthur, the vice president, and then Grover Cleveland, who's on the right. And it's interesting, I included Cleveland because Cleveland was actually the other political party. Frederick um, Douglass is campaigning for Republicans who passed a lot of these uh, anti-slavery, the, the amendments that would end slavery, increase, uh, sorry, increase political rights, increase, uh, well, extend the suffrage and so forth. And uh, Cleveland is actually the Democratic Party and he still retained Douglas as a recorder of deeds for about a year, even though Douglas had campaigned for Cleveland's opponent. So pretty remarkable I heard Douglas is able um, to stay in positions. That kind of tells you something of his influence um, and how a lot of people still admired him. Um, in the middle of his appointment as recorder of deeds, his wife Anna passed away. And so Frederick Douglass remarried. He married to a woman named Helen Pitts, who he's pictured with here. And that marriage, many people thought was very controversial because Helen Pitts was white. A lot of people criticized them for the marriage. Frederick Douglass and Helen ignored the vast majority of that criticism. Sometimes you can find where Frederick Douglass would come back with a stab and come back with a response. He's pretty good. Frederick Douglass is a good debater. I uh, just come back with really quick sentences. So people might say, well, this is an interracial marriage. It's wrong. Frederick Douglass would say there's no such thing as the division of races. The only race that I know is mankind itself. Sometimes people say, well, that's about skin color. It's that she's lighter skin than you are. 
I say nobody said anything when I married a woman a few shades darker than me. I married a woman a few shades lighter, and now everyone has something to say. And then sometimes he'd also say, well, my, my first wife was the color of my mother. My second wife is the color of my father, so I'm impartial to color. Those are the responses you'll find again. Again, I've never found anywhere where a critic comes back and says, oh, wait, no, I have something more to say on it. Uh, Frederick Douglass is good with, uh, with debating. He learned that again from the Columbian Order. The Columbian Order had debate centers. He learned a lot of this at a very early age. Um, and then just real quick, something we like to talk about when the site, that Frederick Douglass was a world traveler. I kind of touched on it with him going to Great Britain. When he and Helen get married, the best example of that is about, a, about a two years later, they decided to go to Europe and to Africa. Um, they see a lot of famous historical and cultural sites. Uh, and Frederick Douglass kept a diary then, which is really cool to read. It's um, at the Library of Congress today. You can see scans of it online. Uh, Frederick Douglass wrote in there, he decided, he and Helen decided they wanted to extend their vacation. And they said, oh, we'll uh, go to Egypt. And Frederick Douglass got very excited. He wrote in his diary, yeah, I hope I'm able to sleep tonight. Uh, and then he wrote about taking a five-day trip down the Nile, which you see on the right-hand side. Um, when he was uh, let's see, in Egypt, he also went to see the pyramids. You can see on the left, that is the Great Pyramid of Giza. Frederick Douglass didn't just go and look at the pyramid, he decided he was going to climb to the top of it. He was 69 years old. That pyramid is more than 400 feet tall. The stones can't really, well, it's really hard to see. There are like camels at the bottom. Those stones are about four feet tall apiece. But Frederick Douglass, at 69 years old, trekked up to the top of that pyramid, sat on the top of it, and overlooked everything. Pyramids, Sphinx, Nile River, you can see it all. This gives you a little insight into Frederick Douglass as a as this really, really interesting person. Frederick Douglass is a man, that's something I say a lot of exciting. Last point when I was being resident minister and consul general to Haiti, Frederick Douglass lived in Haiti for about two years um, in that position. A uh, picture there on the right shows him in Haiti. It's appointed by President Benjamin Harrison, who's on the left. Um, and Frederick Douglass wrote again in Haiti, so we have a lot of information about his experience in Haiti. You go to his house, there are a lot of uh, reminders, vestiges of his time in Haiti. Um, you'll see rocking chair there, wallpaper that was inspired by his time in Haiti. Uh, the president of Haiti at the time, his portrait still hangs uh, in the house at Cedar Hill. And in the last few years of his life, Frederick Douglass was known as the Sage of Anacostia. Um, he'd become this person who people came to looking for wisdom, for inspiration. This picture shows him sitting in his office in his chair at that desk. All of that furniture is still right there in that same position, minus Frederick Douglass, of course, but it's all still right there, just like that. Um, you'll see all those books on the shelves. Uh, Frederick Douglass owned over 2,000 books by the end of his life. Very well read. And you can just barely make out that picture, too. There's a violin um, just uh, over his right shoulder. Frederick Douglass also taught himself how to play violin. Uh, it's the in the middle of doing everything else that he did. He took time to learn violin, and that was something that he passed down um, to his grandchildren. Uh, at least two of his grandchildren played violin, and one became a very famous violinist who taught at Howard University, uh, and was one of the first recorded violinists ever. His name was Joseph, so if you're looking for a famous descendant of Frederick Douglass, Joseph Douglass is probably one of the most well-known. There's still descendants alive today. And they still come back to the house, and some of them are descended from Joseph, so uh, kind of cool. Frederick Douglass uh, died at the house on February 20th of 1895 from a heart attack. It struck very suddenly, uh, unexpectedly. This is a death mask and a cast of his hand. It was made, uh, both these were made the day after he died. You can see them in the museum at the site today. How old? He was 77 years old. A pretty long life to have lived then. And his second wife, Helen, was still alive. She survived him by eight years. She started the process of turning Cedar Hill into a museum. Um, and she formed a group called the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association, which is still around today. They were chartered by Congress in 1900. Um, the membership, the board, is made up of some of his friends and protégés. Helen died in 1903. She gave everything she inherited from Frederick Douglass. She gave all that to the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association. Uh, and they ran the property for about 60 years. 
they did not have their own funding, though. They were funded largely um, through fundraising efforts by prominent individuals like Booker T. Washington and through groups like the National Association of Colored Women. Uh, and that group, more than anybody else, provided probably the most funding. They helped to pay off a mortgage on the house. Um, they helped to do the first major restoration. They helped to pay for a caretaker's cottage to be built behind this house so that somebody could watch over the property and make sure it was safe. So it's important to recognize that Frederick Douglass has mattered to a lot of people for a very long time. His history has always mattered. People recognize that while he was alive, people recognize that right after he died. And that's why his house is saved today, is because of this group effort, all these groups of people coming together to save this place. About 1962, uh, the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association is looking to transfer this property to the federal government. So they actually deeded it to the United States in 1964. Uh, the site had been approved as a National Park Service site just a couple of years earlier. Uh, and so the National Park Service was put in charge of it. Uh, and the National Park Service has now operated the site for a little over 50 years. Um, and uh, it was the third site in the National Park System um, to be dedicated to an individual African American. There have been sites uh, earlier to George Washington Park and the Booker T. Washington. Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, then called the Frederick Douglass Home, was the third African American site in the entire system. And so that makes it a very early site for the federal government to latch on. You think in 1962, it's going on a civil rights movement, or right in the middle of it. And that's when a lot of these sites start to come in. Uh, President uh, John Kennedy actually signed the, the bill that made this law creating this site as part of the national park system. So I think I'm at just a little over half an hour there. I'm going to end and I'm going to uh, take questions. How did he oh, how did he choose the Columbia board? I don't know that he says. I don't know that he says for sure. It was a, it was a common, it was a pretty common lesson book. Went through numerous editions. The first edition was published in 1797, which would have been about 30 years um, before he would have been able to find out about it. Uh, I think it was probably just something he saw, like the Webster spelling book, probably something he saw kids carrying around and thought, I need, I need to get that. Yes. Tell us a little bit about his offspring. Yes, okay, so I talked a little bit about Charles and Lewis um, joining the 54th Massachusetts during the Civil War. Um, all three of his sons were actually active. Frederick Jr. had um, recruited troops along the Mississippi River Valley during the Civil War. Um, his sons were mainly educated by him. They worked in the North Star newspaper office. That uh, was his newspaper uh, in Rochester, New York. and. Uh, they worked uh, with him, uh, and then Rosetta was educated, uh, let's see, in private, she was educated in schools and then in private schools by a private tutor as well. They were all pretty well educated. Um, and as they got to be adults, uh, I think at times it could be hard for them to find jobs. You can see that they jumped around to a lot of different jobs. Mostly what they did, uh, every, at some point in all of their lives, they worked as clerks in D.C., as federal clerks pretty nice middle class positions that were just starting to become accessible for African Americans and for women. Um, so kind of this new uh, job field that they kind of enter into. They're interested in real estate. I think it's interesting because Frederick Douglass had a lot of real estate. They kind of watched what their father did and said, yeah, real estate, that's what it's at. So they uh, all were involved in, or three of them were involved in real estate at some point. And then newspapers too. Frederick Douglass bought a newspaper in DC uh, right around the time that he first moved here, uh, and he had his son's manager. Um, so that would be the three big areas that they really worked in. You get a lot of questions if they achieved the same sort of fame that their father did, and Frederick Douglass was a uh, really an exceptional figure, one of these exceptional figures in U.S. history. So I kind of like asking if Abraham Lincoln's sons ever reached that same level. It probably is not going to happen. It didn't happen with the Douglasses. Um, but they were very well known, um, and they had their own reputations within the side of them. 
The DC newspaper here is the National Arrow, or Douglas calls it the New National Arrow. Um, it's right during Reconstruction that he buys the newspaper and starts to publish it. So that's what that name refers to. Any more questions? Can you explain how slave status and children work? So if you had a free mother and a slave father who was in a non-slave state but was a fugitive, the children were born in what? Okay, so you're just talking, sorry, I missed that. You were asking about Frederick Douglass's particular situation there right. and his children's yes. status. They were legally free. Um, coming from Maryland and really any state at that point, the child status was determined by the mother. So yeah, the mother were free, and that child would be born free. Frederick Douglass was the sole fugitive of their family. That's talking legal status to his um, Of course, for some free people, there was a danger of being captured and enslaved illegally. I'm ignorant of Haitian history. What was Haiti like at the time he was there? Was there active slavery still legal there? No. Or were that's... there freed slaves there at that point? Right. So what ha Haiti had seized its own independence. Um, I forget the year exactly. It's right around the turn of the 18th, 19th centuries. Um, Haiti was looked to as an independent black republic. Um, and that revolution had largely been an event in slave people rising up against the slaveholding class. Uh, and many white people around the world looked at it in shock and horror. Actually, a lot of pro-slavery Americans used it as an example, like, look at what happened to Haiti. This is, this is why slavery used to continue, and they used it as justification. But for many black Americans, they looked to it with pride, and they looked to it as something they're very interested in. Uh, I think we can see that in the Douglas uh, family. I think one thing that's interesting, that portrait of Anna, which I showed, the start, I'll kind of flip through. She's wearing a scarf. There's a piece of jewelry that attaches the scarf together, and the portrait on that scarf, you can kind of see it's a man. It's Toussaint Louverture, who led the revolution. Um, so if you just kind of make out fairly a man's face, then that's supposed to be Toussaint Louverture. That kind of tells me that Douglas is very interested in Haitian history. One thing I find interesting is he did write a lot of letters to his daughter Rosetta while he was there. And the impression I get is that he was disappointed in his Haitian experience. Uh, he said he saw too much evidence of the old slave system. Um, and he said, I think what, why he said that is for a couple reasons. For one, he saw a lot of what he called brutality, beating of um, animals and children in the streets. And he said he saw that as evidence, lingering evidence of slavery. And then uh, still a class structure set up on race. Um, and so with different skin tones, they're being sort of, it's still a racial hierarchy, or at least a skin color hierarchy. Frederick Douglass, I think, was disappointed in that. There are some personal things that happened too. We moved there with Helen. She got, she was sick for a lot of their time in Haiti. And uh, then it was extraordinarily hot in Haiti. And Frederick Douglass wrote about that a lot in his uh, letters to Rosetta. He'd say, like, I'll, I'll tell you what the temperature is. It's like 90 degrees here, and I'm writing in the evening in January. Uh, and then he'd talk about his routine, he'd be like, it's so hot, I can't sleep at night. So I wake up at whatever time in the morning, like 1, 3 in the morning, I go out and look at the stars, and then I lay down and I try to sleep again. And he talked a lot about how hot it was. Just one more question about uh, his children. Did his daughter Annie live until adulthood? And then also, can you talk about some of the unique items of those 27,000 items in the home? Yes, awesome, good question. So um, Annie died when she was 10 years old. Um, sometimes you'll find her referred to as the favorite child. And this picture of, um, of Annie, actually Frederick Douglass is sitting in it too. And it's, uh, the, it's identified on the back as Annie. So that kind of... I think that kind of tells us, yeah, maybe she was a favorite child. <laughs> Frederick Douglass isn't in pictures with his other children. Um, she died from some sort of brain condition. She was 10 years old. Frederick Douglass was overseas at the time. Um, it really hit him hard. You know, of course, you can see, too, he's so active in public. Let's see, for months, he's just, he doesn't appear uh, to be giving speeches, going uh, being in the newspapers, anything like that. Um, 
Now, some of the most significant objects, one I like to talk to a lot, uh, talk about a lot, is down in the museum near where the death mask and hand are. This book is down there, it's called The Seraph. I walked by this book for like a year and a half and never really stopped to think about why important, how important it was. Um, it reads on the cover, it's a Baltimore collection of church music. Frederick Douglass inscribed this book so that we would not forget how important this book was. He wrote on the inside of it, this book was brought with me when I made my escape from slavery in 1838 and is kept in memory of that event. So he was holding it. That's in that, in that first quote that I gave you where he's talking about running away on his own two legs. He talks about carrying a bundle. When he escapes, this book was in that bundle. And that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I can sit there and look at that book for hours a day. Uh, I don't know. I can sit there and look at it for a long time. It makes me tear up. I think it's a really special object. Uh, and it's one I definitely recommend. Just if you get to the site, we're open 9 to 5. You can always walk in those hours and look at that book. Thank you very much. Any questions from Facebook? No, but okay. lots of people are watching, so that's good. good. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ranger Johnson. Please um, uh, thank him again. Join me and thank him again. Thank you. Thank you. And just a um, housekeeping item. Uh, the, if you haven't picked up the program already, it's behind you. Please spread the word. We have this um, on Wednesdays at the lunchtime, same place um, at the same time. And the last day will be October 12th, but uh, the next week, we're going to be a welcoming a ranger from African Americans who warm the world. So please come back again. And tomorrow we have an um, evening program. Uh, it's a round table discussion on Af African American visionaries who use, um, utilize mail to progress their agenda. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>